You were a child growing up. You remember what you want to do? Maybe a better question. Did you get an opportunity to do that as a career, what you want to do when you're young? Anybody able to do what they want to do when they were young? Like you, you wanted to be a teacher and then you became a teacher. Okay, a few of us, a little bit, kind of maybe some, you guys, okay. Uh, it's always a fun question to ask children what they want to do, but we know, we know the answer is going to change. I mean, most likely that kid uh, just doesn't know their passions, their talents, their skills. Uh, they haven't lived life long enough to know what they're actually going to do when they get older. But it's always neat to ask that question to see kind of what their hope and goals are when they're young. And I want to do a bit of that this morning as we've been talking about kingdoms and uh, what we as Christians do in response to tough seasons, whether it's a political season or not. How, how do we act? But before we know what we are to do, we need to know who we are. That's kind of how it can be as kids. Kids need to figure out who they are. They need to mature before they're going to know what they can do later in life. And so before we talk about what we're going to do, we're going to talk about who we are. And so we're going to talk about that in context of being, being citizens of a different kingdom. We're aliens and foreigners in this place here on earth. And we talked a little bit about that last week, and we're going to expand on it this morning. Because I think everybody comes to a point in their life where they start asking big questions. Is this all there is to life? Now, surely there's got to be more than just punching in and out of a clock. Surely there's got to be more than uh, just finding a hobby to take up some time. Surely there's more than hours of scrolling social media. Surely there's more than vegging out in front of the TV. Surely there's more to life than just collecting more stuff. And many of you have found what that is. Many of you in response to that question have responded to Jesus's invitation to belong to a much greater kingdom than what we do just see around us. And the Bible describes this in a lot of different ways, being redeemed, being found, going from lost to being found, from hurt to helped, from being a new creation. And we're going to use this word citizen, but belonging to this different place. Realizing that everything around us, yes, it at some point does just seem to become pointless. Surely there's got to be more than that. And Jesus is saying, yes, exactly. There is more to that. I invite you to a different kingdom. And it, it, can, it can be hard, especially during seasons, political seasons or otherwise, where we just have the pull from people around us, pull from the society to this, this earthly kingdom. And so we need to be reminded, and we will this morning, that we really do belong to a different kingdom. It's a different way of life. And so we're going to look at this, some, some attributes of citizens of heaven, a different characteristics. And it can be interesting because sometimes when you belong to a group of people, you don't even realize the characteristics of those people because you maybe grew up in a certain society or culture or family. You don't you think everybody else has accents. You don't have that accent until somebody's like, oh, you must be from the South. And you're like, how do you know that? Well, I hear that little twang when you say a few different words. And like, oh, yeah, okay. I didn't realize that. Uh, and the truth is for us too, as American citizens, we have attributes that are kind of ingrained in us that maybe we didn't even realize. So I just tried to Google some different things that make Americans stick out than other cultures or nationalities. And here's just a few uh, different responses that came up. Uh, Americans are more individualized. Uh, there's more individualism and pride in doing things ourselves than in most other nations. I mean, you think of other countries, they have multiple generations living in the same household, so we tend to be very different when it comes to that. Uh, Americans pride themselves in equality, meaning equal opportunities for everybody. Everybody, no matter where you can start, should have an opportunity to succeed. Uh, diversity. America is very diverse, different languages, different people group. Uh, something else that sticks out in America is our tipping culture. We tip for everything now. What is with that? Other cultures don't tip at all in restaurants, anything like that. I'm all for that. Um, another thing I'm all for, huge portion sizes. Might lead to something else, but the people come to America, they're like, you have huge portions. Like, I can't eat that. And we're like, yeah, we have to-go bags. That's what we do. 
Uh, we also have free refills in restaurants. Not all restaurants get re- free refills, which is great. Um, another thing I learned, uh, in, in the bathroom, there's like gaps when you go, uh, you know, like in the, the stall. Other countries don't have gaps. It's like, you can't see. It's like, why don't we do that? That doesn't make sense. All right, so there we go. Uh, some things I found out. So now we're going to switch a little bit. We're not just talking about American culture, but as Christians. So if we are called as Christians, citizens in God's kingdom, what, what makes us different? Why are we to look different than other people around us? We may not even realize it as Christians. But these are some things that we're called to do to look different than the people around us. And so there's just a list of markers of citizens of God's kingdom. We're not going to be able to get into everything because, man, there's just so many different markers that Scripture talks about. But here's five that we'll cover this morning. The first one, or actually, let me, sorry, before we get there, going too fast. We're going to read a few, uh, a few, two verses that talk about us being citizens and, and how we see ourselves as citizens. So the first one comes from Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control would transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Uh, The reason I want to read this is the distinction you see it's making, right? You Christians are different. You don't live by the need of your stomach. Your stomach and your food is not your God. There's something different that you are living for, and you're awaiting a Savior coming out of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus, who will come down again. Verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. So we're going to be different. We're going to be different than the world around us. Let me show you another verse, 1 Peter 2, and we're just going to look at the first part of this because we'll read the second part in a bit. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg with you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So again, this verse showing, look, you've been called out of the darkness into light. You weren't a people. Now you are a people. You didn't have God's mercy. Now you do. Based on all of these things, you are going to be different than the people around you. You are part of a greater kingdom, a greater purpose. You have a greater motivation in life. And so there's going to be things that there's going to be things that mark you as different. You're going to look different. So now we're finally on to the first marker of a citizen of God's kingdom. And it's to have full trust in God. A citizen of God's kingdom is going to have full trust in God. They are fully in God this God thing, this kingdom. They're, they're, they're fully in it. They haven't reserved any rights for themselves. They haven't reserved any trust for themselves. Maybe, maybe it is my own kingdom. Maybe I can do my own thing. No, no, no. They are all in understanding that God cares for them, and his kingdom is really what it's all about. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, this extended sermon that Jesus gives a lot of it surrounding this greater kingdom. And we see this trust that he's asking of us in verse 25. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Is is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow, yet they don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. If 
For that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you of little, clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see the emphatic answers that that Jesus is asking for. Does, Does God not care much more about you? Yes. And if God's just having fun making up these new colors to put on flowers and he's caring for the millions of birds that are going from tree to tree, does he not care about you more than these little things? Yes, absolutely. Yet we feel like we have to toil and spin and work thinking this is our kingdom when And we're supposed to have full trust that God has it under control. Okay, yeah, God God knows what I need to eat and drink and all that, but but there's some bigger things that maybe I, I, I need to worry about, things like politics and the direction of our nation and all of that. And so we exchange these things in this parable or the, the, this lesson that Jesus is teaching, but Jesus isn't just teaching about birds and flowers. He's teaching about trust in the small things and the big things. If, if God's going to give us the small things, surely he's also going to be in control of the big things. God has it under control. Now, if you feel like you have to worry about the things of this world, you are absolutely correct. If you're living in, in this world and are worried about the things of the, the world, you should be worried about the world. Your hair should be falling out with worry. I mean, the wars and the money going into wars and, and the, the politics and the culture, like all of those things you should be really worried about. But if you're not, you're not living for this kingdom on earth, your main motivation and energy isn't being put into this kingdom, but it's putting into the kingdom of heaven, then God's got it under control. God's saying, don't don't worry about those things. That's not adding to your life. And we know health-wise, that's actually taking away from your life, the worry and anxiety that you put into that. God's saying, I I got it under control. And so one marker that's going to make you really different from your neighbors is that you're not worried about those things. And you, you might be involved to some degree, but you're not stressing out about them. You're not thinking the world's going to end based on someone's decision or way that they vote. Why? Because, because God's got it. God's in control. Number two, another marker of a citizen of heaven, citizen of God's kingdom, is that we are praying that God's kingdom will be more present. We're praying that God's kingdom will be more present. This comes from a verse that I read last week and. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's the Lord's Prayer. And so I actually want us to read it together. This is from the NIV translation. I know you may have it memorized in a different version, but if we want to try to read it together on the screen behind me together. Verse nine, it says, this then, oh, would you put it up there? There we go. Here we go, together. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We are praying as citizens of heaven that more things of heaven would come down to earth. Now, sometimes, and we talked about this a bit last week, when we lose trust in God's kingdom or we lose trust in our position in God's kingdom, we feel like we need to take things into our own hand. And there's, there's, there's things we need to do for God beyond prayer to make heaven happen here on earth. And so we, we spin and we toil and we try to do everything we can to bring heaven on earth. And some of those things may be good as, as we think political season, the difference we can make in other people's lives. But we don't have that as a mandate in Scripture. The mandate we have from Scripture is to pray. And sometimes we maybe think, well, prayer's not doing enough. Let me 
read a story that I came about this week about the power of prayer and what it can bring about. There was a six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges. Some of you may be familiar with that name. She was one of the first black students initiated in integrating the school at William Fratt School in Louisiana. The school was being integrated as a response to the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. And it faced great backlash. In 1960, the schools in Louisiana were finally being integrated. And so for months, this six-year-old girl, Ruby Bridges, was escorted by federal marshals down the sidewalk into her school. On Ruby's second day of school, an adult woman threatened her with poisoning. On another day, a woman stood along Ruby's route to school displaying a black doll in a wooden coffin. Ruby's family was threatened too. Eventually, her dad would lose her job. Her grandparents were bullied off their farmland. She was the only child in her classroom because once the white parents found out a black child was going to be in the school, they withdrew their children. This is the backlash that Ruby was facing. And there's a man named Robert Cole. He was a psychologist. And he was writing during that time about the morality of children and how they learn about their morality. Is it it from their parents? They get the right and wrong. Is it another source? He didn't He was trying to understand this from a clinical position. He was not a Christian. And so he he wrote a book in 1986 all about this, but he interviewed Ruby in 1960 when she was going through this uh, in her school and interviewing the people in her school about her morality and how she was was surviving in this, not just surviving, but thriving in school. And so he writes about these years and the segregation and desegregation, everything that was happening and his psychological theories about children. And eventually he interviewed one of her teachers and Ruby's teacher said this, I was standing in the classroom looking out the window and I saw Ruby coming down the street with the federal marshals on both sides of her. The crowd was there shouting as usual. A woman spat at Ruby, but missed. Ruby smiled at her. A man shook his fist at her. She smiled at him. Then she walked up the stairs and she stopped and she turned around and smiled one more time. You know what she told one of the marshals? She told them she prays for those people, the ones in the mob, every night before she goes to sleep. And so Coles, the psychologist, had to follow up on this. He, he was focused on how she was sleeping, not what she did before she slept. And so she, he asks her, he goes to his house to interview her doing this. And he says, Ruby was cheerful and matter of fact, if terse in her replies, yes, I do pray for them. So Coles asks why. She, Ruby replies, because. Coles continues in his book to write about how he couldn't understand the devotion to prayer, the endurance of facing what she did every day. He wanted to know how And he never could, so he writes this. When I finally began to take notice of Ruby's church-going activities and those of her prayers, I'm afraid I was very, I was not very responsive to what I heard and saw. I kept wanting to fit what I learned into what I had already learned. So it never did click with him. He never understood the power of prayer and how her connection to God got her through this time. He never understood the words in Matthew 19. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is something so simple. Because we have trust in him, and it's often the little kids that understand trust when they put their hands out and they fully understand their father's going to pick them up and they can have full trust in him. And so we come to our father in times that we don't understand and hard times and we simply pray. Another reminder in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving being made for all people, for kings and all of those in authorities, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Has that described you as a kingdom citizen during this time of heated politics? Have you lived a quiet, holy life with all your prayers and petitions being made for those in authority. That's what marks us as kingdom citizens, that we're willing to pray 
and allow God to be in control. The third thing that marks those as citizens of God's kingdom is that we seek God's kingdom over the kingdom of earth. We seek God's kingdom over the kingdom of earth. And we saw this earlier in Matthew 6, where it said, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given to you. We go after God's kingdom first. That's the filter. God's kingdom is the filter, the things that Jesus asks us to do through which we see everything else. We don't take a political party first and then see scripture through that. We don't see someone else's words first and then see how we can live that out in the world around us after that. We, we seek God's kingdom as the priority first, and everything else comes through that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week because this can be a hard balance because we can absolutely prioritize God's kingdom and still be involved in politics and other things in our world. So how do we balance that? What does that look like? And we'll talk about the ethics of God's kingdom next week, but I want to give us a little bit this week. I, I want to encourage us not to go to either extreme on the political spectrum. Because if, if we go to the political extremes, we, we could see that we're not, we're not different than anybody else in our world. We're not really chasing after God's kingdom above the kingdom of this earth. Because one extreme is to be overly involved in politics where it becomes something that controls you. And often it starts in a really good place that you can make a difference. But how many Christians do we know that politics has made a lot more of a difference in their life than they'll ever make in someone else's life? It's the frog in a boiling pot of water, and before they know it, they're changed. Their attitude towards others in the world is different. They don't look any different. They've become indistinguishable from a certain issue or a political party. Or on the other extreme... Because it can be hard to dip your toes in without being pulled in. I'm, I'm deathly afraid to respond to a, a spam text message from a political party because I already get five a day. And if I accidentally respond to one, I can't imagine how many more I would get. And so you're like, I'm just going to stay under my covers. It's nice and warm here. I'm just going to completely disengage. And again, that becomes indistinguishable from other people around us. Everybody's trying to disengage. I mean, it's, it's impossible to buy a car without, with these days without being a political statement. Or they're making hurricane response a political statement that if you talk to a government organization to try to get your money, you're, you're on a political side, you're on one side of the aisle or the other. And it's just become a ridiculous game that people are playing, trying to get us involved in a certain way. And so it's no wonder we're trying to, trying to escape all of that. But if we're on the, one of these extremes, we become indistinguishable either from a political party or we become indistinguishable from other people. And so there's got to be something that sets us apart. And it's our citizenship and the way we engage and decide we're not going to engage like other people engage. We're going to engage as this First Peter passage talks about engaging. So we've already opened up this passage a little bit. We're going to start again in verse 11. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So we're going to look like foreigners. We're going to look like exiles in how we engage. Verse 12, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. So they're going to see that you're a little bit different the way you conduct your life. Verse 13, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor or to the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. In so many ways in this passage, Peter is talking to us about our personal fidelity, our personal faithfulness to God. How many times have we read a headline stories about someone that was was all about, they were fronting the issue. They were all about pushing an issue forward. And then it comes out the whole time they were a hypocrite. And they were caught in a scandal embezzling money when that, they were, they're all about transparency before. Different issues on both sides of the aisle with leaders. And, 
And what Peter is saying is, look, it's, it's about the inside. It's about your faithfulness and your heart and your submission to others. But while you're submitting to others, you're, you're pushing forward things in, in, in love and in your faithfulness and who you are and how you conduct yourself. So many people want to focus on the outside. Jesus emphasizes over and over again our, our emphasis and our focus on the inside, our heart, and having our heart right. Again, we'll talk about it a little bit more next week and how we can look like exiles and foreigners because, because we are different, because we're, we're citizens of this earth, but in a much greater reality, our priority is for the citizenship of heaven. And the fourth thing that sets us apart, that makes us look different in God's kingdom is that we conform to the patterns of Jesus. And we conform to the patterns of Jesus. We don't conform to the pattern of what someone else may tell us we should look like. We don't conform to a political party. We don't conform to an agenda. We conform to the pattern of Jesus. Romans 12, 2 says it this way. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So you say, okay, what is Jesus's will for me when I vote? What is Jesus' will for me in this difficult season I'm going through? What is Jesus' will for me when I'm figuring out what the next step in life is? It will always be a transformation of our mind. As we come to who Jesus is, how do we figure out who Jesus is? We got to be in our scriptures. We got to be understanding who Jesus is, how he lived, what his priorities are, what he asks for us. And then we will understand God's will. Too often, I think we conform ourselves to others. We conform ourselves to a mentor. We conform ourselves to an ideal of a dream that we used to have. And, and we build our lives around that, build our understanding around that. When in reality, we're to to conform ourselves to Jesus, which means my eyes are above the horizon, which means I don't, I don't rise or fall on the tides of politics. I don't rise or fall on the tides of popularity. I don't rise or fall on, tide, on the tides of the time, but, but my anchor is to Jesus. And so when those bad times come, I'm still looking above them. When the good times come, I'm still looking above them because I'm looking to Jesus, who is my, my sure foundation not to the times around me because I'm conforming to Jesus. Here's the last thing that we'll cover today. We preserve the unity that Jesus prayed for. Our last marker as citizens of God's kingdom is, is that we will, we will continue to be unified. We will fight for unity. We'll be peacemakers because Jesus prayed for it. And one of Jesus's last moments on earth, we get this long prayer that was recorded for us in the book of John. And part of that prayer is for his, his disciples. But then this passage, he says, I don't just pray for them. I pray for those that will believe because of them, which is you and I. This is how he starts in verse 20. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, his, his disciples around him. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, you and I, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then will the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as the Father has loved them. Unity does not mean uniformity. It doesn't mean we're going to have agreement on every issue. And politics is going to be one example of that. But because our mission is way more important than the mission of the United States, because our mission is way more important than the mission of, of one political party, we are going to be unified in thought and in deed moving forward, knowing, I mean, there's so many, so many people out there. And we're a church on a hill. And as we look out, there's so many people that need Jesus. And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go out and we're going to teach all to follow Jesus. We're going to bring them into this, this healing place that, that, that we have, that we, not that we're the sole holders of Jesus, but we have the news, the good news of who Jesus is, and we want them to know it. And so, so our mission is going to be greater than anything that might divide us. And I think sometimes we get divided during these times because we're a bit short-sighted. 
We're short-sighted thinking, well, well, God can only operate if we vote a certain way. Or God can only bring the, the nation back if we do it this way. There's political parties in the United States that have come and gone. Anybody a Whig anymore? Not, no, Federalist? No, there's not really a party anymore. God can operate outside of party affiliations. Think of the first 300 years of church history, the explosion of the early church under, under these dictator-type kings and rulers. Think of modern-day communist China and the spread of the underground church that is happening like wildfire. Now, I'm not saying we vote to make things happen like that. But what I'm saying is we're short-sighted thinking, well, God can only operate inside my box. We need to understand God is a big God. God is a good God. And we have a great opportunity in front of us. We have an amazing time when, when the world is full of hate and the world is full of blaming. And the United States is seemingly full of, of lies. To be different. And we're going to stand out. And what a great opportunity we have to stand out. To have the hope like nobody else has. To have unity like nobody else has. To have trust that it's, it's going to be okay because we have a good God that is in control like nobody else understands. We have priorities and motivations like nobody else has. And you're going to stick out. This might be a great opportunity like no, none other to stick out. And somebody goes, well, you're different. What, what, what's going on? Why, why do you have that when, when I think everything is, is going wrong and every, everybody's making horrible things and they're just going along with the lies? What's up with you? You're a little bit different. Because I am. Because I'm a citizen of heaven. I understand things differently. I understand God's calling me to something different. I'm not going to lower myself by stepping into these lies and this, this hurt and disappointing people even more. What a great opportunity we have. Let me pray for us. God, you've called us into something great. You've called us into your, your kingdom, and it's through Jesus we have this understanding. It's through Jesus who lived into this kingdom. And God, one day we pray for the full realization of your kingdom as we do step into heaven. But until then, God, we pray that heaven would come to earth. Maybe we have a part to play in that in the way we vote, and the way we interact with people, and the way we pray for others. God, I pray that you bring those opportunities forward for us so that people could see we're different. We're not like others. We're not going to go to the extreme so we just look like everybody else, but we're going to stand out, and we're going to be different for you, and we're going to give you the glory in that because we belong to you, and we'd have it no other way. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for joining Norwin Christian Church for this week's sermon. If you are looking to get connected or have questions about NCC, please visit our website, norwinchristianchurch.com. We hope you have a great week and that you'll join us once again next week.